Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again so much for this privilege of coming before you as vessels of mercy, those you have saved, those you have spared from eternal judgment through the blood of your precious Son. Father, we're so grateful and thankful that you rescued us from such a hopeless end, uh, the judgment we deserved and still deserve was taken away and was placed on your son at the cross. Father, please help us never be familiar with this overarching truth about what your love did for us and help us live our lives in joy and freedom based on this love that you uh, once and for all solved our problem of eternal death. Father, we also ask right now that you bless all those that are sick in our congregation, that are struggling in different ways. Uh, you know them intimately, and we ask that you comfort them and give them hope and give them clarity about the tests you have them going through. Father, we ask right, right now that you bless our message, that you uh, guide the speaker and help all of us listen intently with an open heart so that we can hear your personal message for us today, which you planned from eternity past. We ask all these things based on the merits of our precious Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's by the power of your Spirit we pray. Amen. Well, first off, I just want to thank Pastor Collins for the opportunity to step in behind his pulpit uh, any God-ordained pulpit, it's a privilege and an honor to do so. And I'll be uh, teaching this series this week on the board, which is we are nothing more than vessels of mercy. Obviously, the emphasis is on the words nothing more. This phrase, uh, vessels of mercy, is a ripoff from Holy Scripture, as many of you know. And the temptation is to think that we are something more than vessels of mercy. So in this series, we're going to explore what it means to be a vessel of mercy. And this is one thing that we are called, one of many things we're called in Holy Scripture, after our adoption into the family of God through Christ. Through Christ, worthless, evil vessels like ourselves have been brought into the fold. And that's right, I said worthless and evil. And we'll get to that if you don't agree with that. Uh, the more you're into the Word of God with a humble attitude, you see the depths of our worthlessness and, and evil, actually, even though our flesh doesn't like to hear that or admit that. Not only did Christ bring us into the fold, but we were made brand new, made into something with eternal value. However, if you're saved, you must not go forward and live your life in deception. We are called vessels of mercy. It means our very lives are fully and totally about God's mercy towards us. Just think about that. Our very lives, the fact that we're breathing today, still alive, we woke up this morning, and the fact that we're saved, and the Bible says in Ephesians 2, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places already. That is totally 100% something that's a result of God's mercy towards us. And there's nothing good in ourselves that gives us a status or position with Him. This is probably a lifelong journey to come to that uh, conclusion, I guess, in our heart like an honest belief of that in our heart, that there's nothing good in ourselves that gives us a status or position with God, contrary to religion. So I know most of you know this, but the Spirit is testing our hearts in this series. The Bible says God will test our hearts. What does that mean? For example, what motivates you to do certain things each day? And this is for each of us to answer. 
what motivates you to do certain things that you, you probably think are right? What motivates you to do those right things? Obviously, it's good to do the right thing. We've been studying that for a while. But why do you do those right things? Because that's what God looks at. And none of us are perfect in this area, of course, so we can't get condemned. But God wants you to be honest with yourself and examine your heart as to why you do these things. For example, why you're at church this morning. For some of you, it might be out of guilt or obligation. Um, for some of you, it's out of fear of a loved one. I don't know, maybe wrath of your mother or something. Um, for some of you, it might be good motivation. Like, I need God's help, for example. I want to learn His Word. I don't know, but these are subtle motivations that creep in that we don't always stop and take a look at. But God examines our hearts. Hopefully our motivation is the things we do for love, which came up this week. Hopefully love is our motivation. It is the greatest motivation possible. As Paul said, the love of Christ motivates us. So why do we do what we do? The Spirit is testing our hearts with this topic on the board. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. God doesn't just want us to do the right thing. He wants us to do the right thing for the right reason. Him. Go to Proverbs 16.1. Proverbs 16.1. We're going to grab a lot of wisdom from the book of Proverbs in this series. And part of it is the fact that the Lord tests the heart of man to see where he's coming from, you know? You might, might have a friend help you out with something or, or offer to help you out with something, and your question to them might be, where are you coming from? Why are you offering me this help? Because you want to know if it's out of love for you or if it's out of an uh, ulterior motive, right? Well, God's kind of the same way, you know, as our Father, too. He's like, Son, I want you to do this for the right reason. I don't want you to just do it. So, again, nobody's perfect, but this is where He's, you know, growing us. This is sanctification. Proverbs 16, 1 through 3. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Notice that. The Lord's making a clear distinction in verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight. I think I'm doing the right thing. But the Lord weighs the motives. Son, why are you doing that right thing? And then verse 3, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. Some people wonder why their plans aren't established or they don't work out because you didn't do the first part. Commit your works to the Lord, all of them. Do it for Him and your plans will be established. God wants our hearts once again. And look at Proverbs 17.3. Proverbs 17.3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. So get used to it and accept it. The Lord tests hearts. And thank God he's not a condemning God. He's a father that wants his son to do things the right way and for the right reason. So again, the refining pot is for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. So again, the Spirit is going to test our hearts in this series about being a vessel of mercy. Do we operate each day as vessels of mercy, or do we operate as though we are more than that? That's the question on the table in the title of our series. Do we operate each day as vessels of mercy? In other words, purely vessels of mercy. Or do we operate 
as though we are more than that. Pastor's recent blog touched on the so-called goodness of man. On the board, it was called, What is a Good Name? It came out a couple weeks ago. And it says, God is good. Man, on his own, is not, and must be stripped of the latter notion and given wisdom to know the prior. What's the prior? That God is good. So man has to be stripped of the notion that he is good, and only have the wisdom that God is good. Such is sanctification in Christ's good name. Again, such is sanctification in God's good name. After we're saved, God is trying to grow us up into the image of Christ on earth. And as he does this thing, You know, this is part of it on the board. What do you consider good? This has been a major topic for a while now. Everything we do and everything we are and everything we can grow into is because of Christ's good name. And if that's not our our motivation or our reasoning behind what we do, then our motivation is off in that area. So on the board, we as believers, as those who have turned to Christ in humble, repentant faith, must never confuse goodness in our lives as belonging to ourselves. And these are subtle things, folks. I know many of you right now, you read this point, you're like, yeah, I know that. That's great. (laughs) What was your motivation yesterday when you did something good? Did you get a little puffed up because you did it better than someone else or you did something no one else would do? No, of course not, right? We never get puffed up. Again, we as believers, as those who have turned to Christ in humble, repentant faith, must never confuse goodness in our lives as belonging to ourselves. We must never be deceived into thinking there is something good about ourselves on our own. And this is one reason Holy Scripture calls us vessels of mercy. Thank God for that title. Think about it. What does the word mercy imply? And I'm not going to go into it right now, but you think about it. What does the word mercy imply? When nothing more than vessels of mercy, not even 0.01% more. When nothing more than a product of God's grace alone. And to realize that is to be set free knowing we are completely in the Lord's gracious hands. But to get there, we must come to agree with what the Bible says about our total depravity. It's not a coincidence that on Thursday, Pastor Collins ended our series with the topic of self-righteousness. And in a way, it seemed like it kind of came out of the blue. Because we were talking about a good name, and we were talking about, you know, the Lord's good name. And then self-righteousness came up. Hopefully you heard the the message online at least. But one thing pastor said was that self-righteousness discredits the Lord's good name. And this goes right into our series this morning. Regarding the world seeing our choices, self-righteousness discredits the Lord's good name. To God be the glory. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 In other words, is it to you be the glory? even a little bit, or is it to God be the glory? Why do we try to steal some of the Lord's glory? Why do we do that? We all do it. At times, different areas of our lives may be, if not in our actions, in our hearts. We take a little bit of credit, pat ourselves on the back as though something good was from ourselves. This is the plague of self-righteousness. The plague of self-righteousness. I am right. I've come up with a good plan. I've solved that problem. I've done the right thing. And then our heads blow up. Right? We got a big head. And before you know it, before you know it, you're a Christian stealing just a little bit of the glory from God. Again, it's the plague of self-righteousness. 
that's going to be with us till the day we die. The question is, will we master it by grace through faith, or will it master us over time? Here we are as believers, as those who have been called by God, having turned to Christ as our only hope, and yet we still can live in or think with self-righteousness. So on the board, the Spirit has a question for us to ponder. Why is anyone self-righteous, even as a believer in the Lord? Why? Think about it. Why is anybody self-righteous? The answer is, he thinks he's better than he is. And that's the only possible answer. He thinks he's better than he is. That's why anybody is self-righteous. He thinks there's something good about him when the Bible says there's not. He thinks he's something more than a vessel of mercy, even if ever so slightly. And remember, all the flesh wants is a little bit of credit. Lord, I don't want that much. You've done so much for me. You know, you took care of it all on the cross. You said it is finished. But even though it's finished, you know, look what, I, look what I've done here. Most people aren't doing this for you, Lord. It's very subtle. The flesh is very sneaky. And all it wants is a little bit of credit, a little bit of glory. Just so it can say it had something to do with it. And it's really like, you know, sad and ugly and disgusting. But we all do it. And, and that's where repentance comes in. When we see that about ourselves. And that's where examining our hearts comes in. So we do examine our hearts and say, why am I doing this thing? Why am I doing that thing? If you just take that second to ask that question, you might be surprised at the answer. And then by grace, God says, repent. Change your mind. Turn around from that thought. It was wrong. And do it for love for Christ. Do it for your love for me. So this also came up on Thursday regarding a believer's error. Self-righteousness is speaking the language of the world. The world economy of creature credit is wholly dependent on self-righteousness. When a known believer decides to compete at that level, the message we are sending is that we are phonies. That's the message we're sending to the world and people that are observing our choices, that we're phonies when we're self-righteous. When we act as though there's something good about ourselves or better about ourselves than someone else, we're not representing Christ properly. There's nothing good about me. It's all... Anything good about me is all because of Christ, right? And so that's what people need to see in your actions and your words. Or we give him a bad, bad name. And this is what happened to the believers in Galatia. And we are not immune to this. After turning to Christ through Paul's ministry, the Galatians started to think they had to have a peace in it. They had to have a contribution in salvation. And this is a good lesson for us all after the recent teaching on obedience to the Lord's commands and the peaceful fruit of righteousness. What do we learn? When we obey the Lord in humility and follow His ways, we receive the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now there's a chance to take some credit in that because you're the one obeying, right? Or are you? Your, your will is certainly involved, but can you take credit for that? So this is where we have to be on guard for our hearts and the right motivation. As believers, we ought to obey God in our lives because we realize how much He loves us, not because we are good in ourselves and can earn God's favor out of self-righteousness. So it's back to motivation. Our obedience to God, if it's godly, has nothing to do with self. Again, just think about that. Our obedience, if it's godly, it has nothing to do with self. It has to do with gratitude for the one who gave us everything. In fact, we'd probably say it's self getting out of the way and listening to the Spirit and the Word. 
we must beware even now to not fall into the trap that the Galatians fell into. So turn in your Bibles to Galatians 1, verse 6. Let's see a couple examples of this. Galatians 1, 6. <clears throat> we must never think we have it all down pat. That's when we get puffed up and we trip and fall, as we will see. But look what happened to the Galatians. This is what Paul wrote to the Galatians after he was with them for a while. Then he left. And then Paul heard some things about the Galatian church and he said, Oh, you're kidding me. And he wrote this letter to them. And in verse uh, 6 of chapter 1, he said, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him, Christ, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So they were quickly deserting him who called them. And that's someone that might be disturbing you. It might not even be a person necessarily, but it might even be your flesh, your sinful nature, your evil roommate whispering on your shoulder that you're good enough or that you have something to do with your salvation. Uh, salvation has already been fully purchased by the Lord and it's fully trusting in Him that frees us to live for Him, to do these good things. So again, it's not putting the cart before the horse. Look at Galatians 3.1. Galatians 3.1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do that by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Obviously, it's by hearing with faith, right? So the Galatians received Christ by hearing the good news from Paul. They accepted it by faith. That's the Spirit's way. But what did they do? They, they entered the works of the law into the picture of the gospel. That there was some type of earning they had to do to either get it or to keep it. And that is contrary to faith. If it's by faith, which we know it is, then why do we try to earn God's favor with works? And again, I'm talking about your subtle motivation. I know, you know, academically, if I asked you that question, you'd say, no, we can't earn our salvation by our works. But in your heart, when you're doing your daily things and, and your faith is tested or you have doubts in your soul and you try to earn your way with God just a little bit, just to hedge your bet, just in case you're wrong, just in case you're whatever. But again, the focus is on you wrongly as though it's dependent on you. We all do it. Works are a way of saying thank you to God, never a way of earning our way with Him. Works are a result of salvation, not the means. And until we um, buy that in our own souls, we're going to fall into self-righteousness. We're going to fall into this trap from time to time. Go to Galatians 6, 12. Works are done by faith, by the power of the Spirit, not by the works of the law, not by being perfected by the flesh. Galatians 6, 12. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Now stop right there for a minute. Think about the early church. 
Think about the lives of the early Christians that were mostly newly converted Jews. Jewish believers in Christ. They realized He was the, the Lord, the Messiah, the promised one, right? They believed. But then what does it say in verse uh, 12? They compel you to be circumcised so that they won't be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Because if you were a Jew and you said, you don't need to be circumcised, guess what? You're going to be attacked by your brethren, believers and unbelievers. So just so I can avoid that pressure, I'm going to add to the gospel and say this is required to be saved. Verse 13, For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. Give you some credit. Give you some glory. They want to boast in your flesh. See, Paul saw right through it all. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's awesome. Those who walk by this rule, that we are a new creation strictly by grace through faith, not by works. You walk by that rule, you'll have peace and mercy. You'll have the peaceful fruit of righteousness in your soul and in your life. So this is all about having a right understanding of our flesh. Our flesh doesn't just want to sin. It wants to be good also. And it wants to receive just a little credit. So on the board... Man's flesh, which includes his relative goodness, is worthless in God's eyes. Worthless. God's ways are not our ways, right? His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, as high as the heavens are than the earth. That's how much higher his thoughts are than our thoughts, Isaiah 55. God says, our goodness is worthless. So you're going to believe yourself? Or your opinion? Or are you going to believe what God says? After being saved by His grace, it is dangerous and stupid to fall into the trap that the Galatians did. That we ourselves can be righteous before God in our own strength and wisdom. That we have a part in God's salvation. Again on the board, man's flesh which includes his relative goodness, is worthless in God's eyes. And because we fall into this trap of thinking we have worth on our own, because of that, that's one reason we need the Word of God to cleanse our souls every day. And if you're not on that train yet, you know, you're really missing out. Without this, you're going you're gonna to fall for these traps. Without the cleansing of our soul every day, you're going to fall for these traps. And if you think you're too smart to fall for these traps, that proves how stupid you are. Because that's arrogance. That's pride, right? And as we're going to see in a minute, pride comes before a fall every single time. So, you know, you do, we do it to ourselves. And, you know, no one's beyond this. I've done it a million times. But that's why we need the Word of God so desperately to cleanse our souls from the garbage thinking that infiltrates us, that, you know, gets us in self-righteous mode that gets us to take some credit, that gets us to compare ourselves to others so that we deceive ourselves. And remember, we all have a little religion in us. It might be a different type or a different brand. We all have a little religion in us. That's the part that wants to find a way to take some credit. So turn to Proverbs 30, verse 1. I want to share with you a verse that I... I read uh, last week, and I was like, wow, that's awesome. And it, of course, it was while I was studying for this series on uh, that we're nothing more than vessels of mercy. So it just um, is a nice, humble perspective. And if we keep this perspective, well, you know what? We might actually have peace and uh, joy in our souls. 
because we give up our, our self-contribution. Proverbs 30, verse 1. The words of Agur, the son of uh, Jake, the oracle, the man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ucal, Surely I am more stupid than any man. Hallelujah. Right? Amen. What an awesome statement. Surely I'm more stupid than any man. And uh, that, there, therein lies freedom, folks. No matter how smart you think you are, we're all stupid in some areas of life. And, uh, and sometimes the more intelligent you can be, the more stupid you can be because of pride. But look at Eger's wisdom and humility. Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. <laughs> look at that phrase. Think about the knowledge of the Holy One who's above all and knows every single thing. Are you even close? So stupidity is a good thing to claim in honesty. And verse 4, he goes on to say, Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. Two things I asked of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. That's the first thing. And that includes self-righteousness, right? That's one of the greatest deceptions we fall into, self-righteousness. He said, keep deception and lies far from me. And then he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Why does he say that? We've seen this before. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I will not be full and deny you and say, who's the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Back to God's name, right? What an awesome passage. But verse 8, keep deception and lies far from me. Agar knew his weakness, the weakness of his flesh, the tendency of the flesh to try to grab a little glory. So this man did not think more highly of himself than he ought to. And he actively asked God to protect him from that, from himself even. Think about that in verses 8 and 9. He actively asked God to protect him from himself, from his own stupidity, arrogance, etc. So do we pray like that? Do we pray like that, aware of our tendency to rely on the flesh and to boast in the flesh? Almost like to see what's coming. Almost like you know what's coming, you know your enemy, and that your flesh wants to do that. If not today, tomorrow. Take a little credit. So do we pray actively asking God to protect ourselves from our own flesh and our own pride? This man goes on to talk about self-righteousness in verses 12 and 13. Look at uh, Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a kind who is pure in his own eyes. There is self-righteousness, my friends, to a T. There is a kind who is pure in his own eyes, yet is not washed from his filthiness. There is a kind, oh, how lofty are his eyes, and his eyelids are raised in arrogance. Oh, may we never get like this as believers. And we're often encouraged throughout Holy Scripture to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think that we're better, that we're smarter, that we're moral or more moral than the next person. And that's why when our brother fails in a certain area, we are told to love him and restore him, not to judge him. Or the Bible says we can fall into the same trap, the same temptation, the same failure. How does that happen? I don't even know how that happens. That's like a spiritual phenomenon from the flesh. That's like, how does it happen that 
when you judge someone that you end up falling into the same trap they fell into. But that's how weak and wicked the flesh is. And that's why we're told to just guard against that, because this is what's going to happen. Have you ever judged someone for doing something that when you stop and think about it, you also do or have done? Anybody? <laughs> have you ever judged someone for doing something that you also do or have done? Of course, right? And that's where it's embarrassing to realize you just judged somebody. But we do it. Why do we do it? The arrogant flesh. I'm a little bit better than the other guy. Go to uh, Galatians 6, verse 1. Galatians 6, 1. <clears throat> so this is all setting the stage for this series this week on the vessels of mercy. And that we're nothing more than that. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Notice a few things there. First of all, the person's caught in the act. They, they, they're caught. They'll get you eyewitness type of thing, okay? They're caught in a sin. If you're spiritual, restore them with an attitude of gentleness. Why? each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Why that's the case or how it works, I don't know. But that's how it works. So be on guard. Restore them in gentleness. Don't judge them or you yourself will also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So on the board... We are nothing more than vessels of mercy. And when we forget that, we are in for a rough ride in life. We can learn the easy way or we can learn the hard way. Just like we tell that to our children, that's what God says to us children. That law, if you will, stays true throughout life, right? Just like reaping and sowing does. So again... We're nothing more than vessels of mercy, and when we forget that, we are in for a rough ride in life, even as believers. Proverbs 11.2, Proverbs 16.17, 18.12, Isaiah 2.11-12, through 12, Matthew 23.12, and Romans 9, which is where we get our phrase, vessels of mercy. Ironically, we're not even going to get to it this morning, but you can read that on your own if you want. So Holy Scripture says things like pride comes before a fall and that God humbles those who exalt themselves. So let's take a look at these scriptures so that we might not fall into the trap of thinking we're something more than a vessel of mercy. Uh, hold your place in Galatians and go to Proverbs 11.2. Proverbs 11.2. Again, we are nothing more than vessels of mercy. And when we forget that, we are in, a, in for a rough ride. Again, it goes back to uh, the importance of humility, right? Proverbs 11.2. When pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is wisdom. Pretty cool, pretty straightforward. When pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is wisdom. Go to Proverbs sixteen seventeen. Proverbs sixteen seventeen. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Haughty means arrogant. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. This reminds me of a story. I once knew a young man who was a waiter, and he went to the table to clear off some dishes, and the table was full of dishes. 
and he started piling them up, one on top of the other, a little, you know, carelessly. And the woman at the table said to him, are you sure you want to take that many? It doesn't look easy. And then the young man's head swelled up. I can do it. Let me show you. I got this piece of cake. Then the thing of dishes started to do this. It fell right on the lady's lap. Thank God she laughed in hysterics after the pride that she saw in me, the young waiter. But verse 17, a haughty spirit comes before stumbling. Doesn't it always happen when you get a little puffed up, then all of a sudden you trip and fall? It's, it's like universal in life. And God gave us that as a uh, <laughs> nice thorn in the flesh, maybe, as a nice way to check us right when we get puffed up. Happens every time. You tell a great athlete he's great, what happens? Strikes out the next five times. Why? Because it went to his head, and now he's not concentrating. He's not humble anymore to concentrate on his job anymore. Every area of life. Thank God for this, huh? Again, verse 17, pride goes before destruction, but a haughty spirit before stumbling. And look at Proverbs 18, 12. <laughs> We're so stupid, aren't we? Surely I am a stupid man. Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but humility goes before honor. So again, we see these things simply follow one another. After pride comes destruction, after humility comes honor. That's how life rolls. And go to uh, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. Isaiah 2, 11. So again, we're uh, talking about the point on the board. We're nothing more than vessels of mercy. And when we forget that, we're in for a rough ride in life. Isaiah 2, 11. The proud look of man will be abased, and the loftiness of man will be humbled. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. See how he gets all the glory, one way or the other? question is if we go willingly or not, <laughs> give it to him willingly or not. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Verse 12, for the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up that he may be abased. And on the board, Matthew 23, 12, our Lord said, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So let's see some warnings in Scripture before we close about our attitude towards ourselves. What is your attitude towards yourself or about yourself? How do you think about yourself? Namely, that we don't become arrogant about what we perceive as good about about us. that we don't become arrogant about what we perceive as good about us. Because all good things come from our Heavenly Father above. So go back to Galatians 6, verse 1. Galatians 6, 1. And again, we're going to see what the Bible says about our attitude towards ourselves. What should it be? Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. On the board, Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Now that's a statement. There's more hope for a fool than for a man that thinks he's wise in his own eyes. 
So if you look in the mirror and you think you're wise in your own eyes, you think, you think you're something, smarter, better, et cetera, et cetera, there's more hope for a fool. So what do we do? <laughs> Repent. Turn back to God in humility. Just confess that pride you're carrying around. Go to Romans 12, verse 3. In your Bibles, Romans 12, verse 3. Got a few more scriptures before we close and celebrate communion. Romans 12, 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So again, there we see, we're told not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Look at verse 16, Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Are you wise in your own estimation at times? I know I am. And I pray that I see it right away so I can repent and give all the glory to God for anything good in me. See, these are things that creep up on you. Like These are things that we um, maybe even don't think we do. Maybe we're in denial that we, we do these things, that we're wise in our own estimation. But they creep up on you like a cat creeping up on a bird. Before you know it, it pounced on you. It's grabbed your soul, that little arrogance, that little pride. Do not be wise in your own estimation. So you see how, see how we're given all these warnings over and over throughout Scripture. Do you see how we have to stay on guard for this? It's like part of our prayer life. Like Proverbs 30, Lord, don't let me be stupid. I know I'm stupid. Lord, you know, don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. I don't want to, you know, do the things I know I'm capable of doing against you. That's the right heart. That's the humble heart saying, I'm on guard, Lord. I know I'm nothing more than a vessel of mercy. I am garbage without you. But it takes humility. It takes getting your flesh out of the way because we hold on to these things, don't we? So go to 1 Corinthians 3.18. 1 Corinthians 3.18. I am not going to get nearly as far as I thought, but c'est la vie. You'll have to tune in on uh, Tuesday. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Is this going okay? Let's see here. Okay. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. Now, what's that about? What is he saying there? Why, why that type of a warning? If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. He must honestly admit his stupidity compared to God Almighty, the knowledge of the Holy One in Proverbs 30. We literally know nothing compared to God. And that humility is the only thing that's going to save us and give us true wisdom. Look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Again, we're talking about how are we supposed to look at ourselves? What is our attitude towards ourselves? 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known 
by him. So see how God's after love and not knowledge there. Nothing wrong with knowledge, as long as it doesn't puff you up. But love is the key. Again, in verse 2, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. So right when you think you know, you're not knowing what you think you know. Does that make sense? Anyway, pride comes before a fall. These are all warnings in the letters to the churches written to believers in Christ. Those last four verses we read, written to believers in Christ. Why? Apparently, the Spirit knows the temptations of the flesh even better than we do. Go figure, right? God's omniscient, the knowledge of the Holy One. He knows us like the back of his hand, right? It's like a father knowing a little boy and the little boy's weaknesses, even though the little boy doesn't even know him yet. The father can see them. So how much more our Heavenly Father? So by grace, God warns us over and over through Holy Scripture so that we don't forget where we came from. That's a big problem. That's why we fall into these traps. When things are going well or we start learning and we, we get a little puffed up in our knowledge, we fall into these traps. We forget where we came from. We forget where God saved us from. A place of hopelessness filled with sinfulness before God. That's where we came from. Do you forget? When you were lost and confused in your heart and like you knew you were a sinner and that you didn't know what to do or you didn't know how you could please a holy God, and then God showed you, you can be saved by grace through trusting in Christ from the heart. God even granted us the faith to place our hope and trust in him, right? That's where we came from. God's like, don't forget what I saved you from. Don't forget that it was my reaching down to you that saved you. He's the one that called us. We didn't go to him. He's the one that by grace reached down to us. Don't forget that you had nothing to do with this other than receiving my promise, God would say, by hearing with faith. This has nothing to do with your own works of goodness. But we forget where we came from. We get a little bit arrogant. And that is a curse of our sinful flesh. We often conveniently forget where we came from so we can try to take some credit with God. You know that saying, we forget what we want to forget? We conveniently forget. The flesh conveniently turns a blind eye to this thing that God did all the work, for example. Forgets about the sinful place he came from and the, the place of judgment and death that he was under. And says, let me just forget about that for a minute. Just for a minute. Because my flesh is pretty good. I want to take a little credit, Lord. And you know my flesh is pretty good. And then God goes, bam. <laughs> Thank God he doesn't do that, right? He doesn't squash us like a bug, but he will discipline us because of his tremendous love and patience with our arrogance. Thus, one of the Spirit's purposes from this series, or for this series, is to instill in our souls that we are nothing more not one ounce more than a vessel of mercy. So let's go back to the drawing board for a minute as we close. Where did we come from on the board? Where did we come from? All men are born in sin, Romans 5.12. There's no soundness in us, Isaiah 1.6. Man's heart without Christ is desperately sick and deceitful. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. Amen? If you're honest with yourself, you know where you came from. Now, we need to be reminded of these things because we're stupid and prideful. But that's why God keeps bringing us back to this, really, doesn't he? Reminding us of why we should be humble, even still, even as a saved individual, even as a son of God now, a child of God why we should still be humble. We must never forget where we came from. That's like our resource. That's like our well. We can always go to that well to drink of the truth 
so that we can be refreshed instead of deceived by the flesh drinking in some oasis and drinking up sand. Let's just look at a couple verses before we close. Romans 5.12 All men are born in sin. And that includes you ladies, too. In case you thought you were excluded from that one. All men are born in sin. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Any questions? Death spread to all men because all sinned. And what's the punishment for sin? Death. Death. Not a temporary punishment that we can recover from. Death is permanent without Christ. And that's what we're all due for our sin. That's where we were born into that, um, you know, prison cell. And when we forget that, that God saved us from eternal death, we got a big problem. We get puffed up. We lose our way. Death is an illustration of how helpless and hopeless we are on our own. Our second point on the board is there is no soundness in us. Go to Isaiah 1, verse 4. Isaiah 1, verse 4. Again, the Bible says there is no soundness in man. Isaiah 1 4. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it. Only bruises, welts, and raw wounds not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. That's man's soul without the Lord. There's no soundness in it. Nothing. Bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Nothing excluded. And then finally, man's heart without Christ is desperately sick and deceitful. Go to Jeremiah 17.9. Who can understand man's heart? Man's heart without Christ is sick. All you got to do is be honest about the things that pop into your head from time to time. And you're like, why did I just think of that? And that is disgusting. And that is against God. Where did that come from? Why did I just consider that? Without God, we're oof. Is that a word? Oof. Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert, and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord. Remember, trust, trust in the Lord comes from the heart. Verse 8, for he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. And then verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the result of his deeds. And at this point, let's remind ourselves that our deeds, which is what we're judged for ultimately, our deeds are a result of where our heart is at. Is our heart with self, 
with the flesh or is our heart with Christ? In humility, are we asking Christ to fill our heart or in arrogance are we trying to fill it ourselves? So as we've seen, the Lord is testing our hearts regarding our own goodness in this series. And we could go on and on about man's total depravity, and we might by the end of this series, if the Spirit leads. But for our final point today on the board, understanding our total depravity opens our eyes to appreciate and love God more and more for having mercy on us. If we don't understand our total depravity, if we don't admit our total depravity before God that we're disgusting without Him, we're not going to be set free. We're not going to uh, enjoy and relish and have peace and gratitude and happiness for what God did for us, for the extent of God's mercy, the 100% mercy that we've been saved by. Nothing to do with us. So again, understanding our total depravity opens our eyes to appreciate and love God more and more for having mercy on us. And we'll continue with uh, the series on Tuesday. Let's celebrate communion now. Uh, ushers, please pass out the elements. And let's get some music, please. <coughs> So there's not much more to say, I think, Um, this morning's message um, should make us appreciate God's mercy more and more and what he did for us on the cross. Um, The place of utter hopelessness that we came from as sinners before a holy God, we don't even appreciate. No matter how much we study the Bible, we don't know the depth of that. And one day in heaven we'll, we'll see it and see God with all his glory. But um, what the Lord did on the cross, there wasn't a more complete thing done in the universe. And thank God he said it is finished before he passed. So let's read 1 Corinthians 11.23 as we celebrate his sacrifice for us. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in memory of our Lord let's eat the bread In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, 
saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In memory of our Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and we ask that you help us be more and more grateful and aware and understanding of what you done, you've done for us through your son's sacrifice. We know we have a long way to go, Father, but we also know you love us and have the perfect patience of a perfect father. And we're grateful to you for that. We're grateful to you for sanctifying us, for molding us into the image of your son one day at a time. And Father, we're grateful most of all for your mercy. It was your mercy alone that thought of us, that reached down to us, that saved us. Father, we ask that you help us take this wonderful truth out to a lost and dying world that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Christ's precious name, and it's by the power of your Spirit we pray. Amen.